George Bernard Shaw said that the statistics regarding death are very impressive, that one out of every one dies. So death is a, a natural part of life. But though death is universal, that everybody experiences it, and though death is natural, it's also terrifying uh, for most people. Hamlet, uh, in Hamlet, Shakespeare called death the undiscovered country from which no traveler returns. Famous French writer said, one cannot look directly at either the sun or at death. An English philosopher, Francis Bacon, wrote, men fear death as children fear the dark. Even the Bible speaks negatively about death. The Bible calls or says that death is an enemy. In fact, the Bible calls death the final enemy that will be dealt with. That's what Paul told the Corinthians. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. We fear death, and rightfully so, because it's an enemy. Death is a dark foe. David talks about its darkness, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. I've sat with many people as they've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, grieving the loss of someone that they loved. But I tell you that I didn't really even understand how much pain there was in death until we experienced the gut-wrenching agony of our own daughter's death. We hate death. We fear death. We try to avoid thinking about death, and yet we're obsessed with death. Some scientists tell us that the average person thinks about death several times every single day. We're obsessed with that. Whether we're young or whether we're old, we're obsessed with death. We're absorbed in the aspects of death. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that people are obsessed with death. Jesus knew that people feared death, that they were terrified by death. Jesus knew that people experienced deep agony at the prospect of their own death or of the death of someone that they loved uh, deeply. And, and so he talks about death. He tells what, about death in many different places in which he talks with his disciples because he knows everything about death. It, he is its master. John in the book of Revelation quotes Jesus saying, I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus is death's master. There's a story in John's gospel, and you can turn to it in John chapter 11, that teaches us a great deal about death. It teaches us also many things about Jesus. I know that we've all heard stories and read stories about men and women who have died on the operating table or in some kind of an accident and then come back to life a few moments later. But the story that John is going to tell us here in John chapter 11 is not like that at all. There's absolutely nothing usual about this story, nothing normal about it. It's absolutely a supernatural story. The story found in John 11 begins with Jesus and his apostles out of the area. It says, they were in Perea when this story happened. Perea would be uh, on the east side of the Jordan River. It's what would be in the country of Jordan today. And Jesus had left Judea because of the opposition of, of the Jewish leaders in Judea. It wasn't that Jesus was hiding in Perea. People knew that he was there, and many people were coming out to him and listening to the message that he was proclaiming, and many people were being saved in Perea where Jesus was ministering and preaching. It just that Perea was out of the way, and, and so it allowed him to go ahead and preach and go ahead and teach and prepare his apostles for what was ahead without facing the opposition of those who were leaders in Jerusalem. And it's while Jesus is there in Perea that he receives news that a friend of his, Lazarus, is sick. Now, Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, were particularly close to Jesus. Jesus had stayed in their home on many times when he'd been visiting in the area around Jerusalem, and Mary and Martha sent word that Lazarus was sick. They expected Jesus to do something. They expected that Jesus would come quickly and that he would arrive in time to be able to, to help their, their brother whom they loved deeply, that he would arrive in time to heal Lazarus. They believed in the power that Jesus had and they believed that he would come 
and that he would help. But Jesus doesn't immediately head back to Judea. He takes two days there in Perea to continue the work that he's doing there before he finally tells his apostles it's time for us to head back. Now, those two days wouldn't have made any difference. Because by the time that Jesus arrives back in Bethany where Mary and Martha and Lazarus live just outside the city of Jerusalem, Lazarus had already been dead not two days but four days. He'd been in the tomb that long. So it was too late for Jesus to do anything about Lazarus. That's what the sisters believed. That's what everybody believed. Now Jesus had brought back a couple of people from the dead already, but they were different from this situation. There was the widow's son in Nain, and there was Jairus' daughter, but, but both of them had just died. The daughter was still in her room, and the son was being carried out the same day. They just died. And so, so maybe you could assume that they were just in comas or just, you know, it looked like they were dead, but they really weren't. Maybe you could assume that, but not with this one because Lazarus had been dead for four days. He'd been in his tomb for four days. Nobody attending to him, nobody helping him in any way. He'd been dead and nobody could deny that. Mary and Martha assumed that it was too late for Jesus to do anything to help Lazarus, but Jesus knew otherwise. Take away the stone, he said. And then he looked up to his father in, his, in heaven and he prayed and he thanked his father for what he was about to do. And then he looked down at the front of the tomb of Lazarus and he said, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man walked out alive from his tomb. Now some of these people who were standing there had seen Jesus do remarkable things. They'd seen lepers cleanse. They'd seen blind men start to see. They'd seen lame men walk again. They had watched him as he spoke to the wind, and the wind immediately died down. They had watched as he walked across the lake as though there were sidewalk in the middle of the water. They had seen him take a few morsels of food and feed multitudes with it, but they'd never seen anything like this. They'd never seen anybody who'd been dead for four days come out of the tomb alive. They had never seen a miracle like this one. And so the story of Lazarus tells us something about the heart of Jesus. Jesus loved Lazarus. When the sisters sent word to Jesus that their brother was sick, they didn't say to Jesus, come quickly. There was no request of Jesus that he come to Bethany because the sisters knew they didn't have to make that request. They knew that Jesus loved Lazarus. They knew that Jesus would come. They simply said, so the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And saying that, they knew Jesus would head toward Bethany to provide help for the one that he loved. There's a story that's told that comes out of the battlefields of World War I. Two friends were fighting on the same battlefield, and one of them was wounded, and he was left with a serious wound, unable to move, lying helpless in no man's land between the two armies. The other in the dark, at peril to his own life, crawled to where his friend lay wounded. And when he reached him, the wounded man looked up at him and he said, I knew you'd come. And, and that's what Mary and Martha thought about Jesus. They knew he'd come. They knew he'd come. Because Jesus loved Lazarus. Jesus was deeply moved by the grief of the sisters of Lazarus. John records in verse 33 and verse 35, when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then it says, Jesus wept. That's the picture of God that Jesus wants to communicate to us. That God loves, that God cares, that God feels what we're feeling, that God weeps when we weep, that God laughs when we laugh, that God cares about what we're going through. The word that John uses to describe what Jesus felt, these are, are strong words 
The words deeply moved literally means to snort with anger. Boiling, like, like boiling water or rolling seas. That's what's going on inside of Jesus. Jesus deeply felt the grief of the sisters. And he joined that grief. He grieved too. I know that was one of the passages from the Bible that most significantly ministered uh, to Claudia. She struggled to grapple with Becky's death. The fact that Jesus deeply grieved in the death of his friend Lazarus gave Claudia permission, the sense of God's permission that it's okay to grieve, that death is something that we can grieve about because death is our enemy and death is terrible. God grieves death and he gives us permission to grieve too. Now the Greeks, they had a different picture of God. The primary characteristic of God in the Greek mind is wrapped up in a word, a Greek word, it's the word apatheia. It's the word from which we get apathy. And, and it means basically this, this inability to feel any emotion whatsoever. And that's the picture of God that the Greek mind had. They thought that, that God couldn't feel sorrow or joy, that God couldn't feel gladness or grief, that God couldn't be affected by what was going on in anybody else's life. And they believe that because if you or, or God or anyone else is affected by somebody else, if we grieve because of what they're going through, if, we, if, if what they're going through affects the way that we feel, then that means they, in some sense, have power over us. And nobody has power over God. So therefore, they believe that, that God couldn't feel. They had this idea of God as a lonely, isolated, passionless, and compassionless God. God didn't feel anything. But Jesus here gives us a picture of an entirely different kind of God. He paints God as a God whose very heart is contorted with anguish over the grief that he sees us feel. He shows us a God who in the most literal way is afflicted with our afflictions. He shows us a picture of a God who cares, who has compassion for what we go through. It enters into our feelings. Jesus was Lazarus' friend, and the astounding thing is that Jesus is my friend, too, and that he's your friend, that he loves us just like he loved Lazarus. To the apostles, Jesus would say, greater love has no man than this, than that he would lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. That was his word about his apostles, and that's his word about us, that he calls us his friends. He loves us. And what's the mark of love? What's the mark of friendship? It is that our friends come to help us when we have needs. And that's what Jesus wants to communicate, that he loves us, that he's our friend, and he comes to help us whenever we're in need. Mary and Martha knew that Jesus would come and help Lazarus, and we can know that Jesus will come and help us too. This is love, to grieve, or rather to give what we have to meet the needs of others. And that's Jesus promised us, that he will give what he has to meet our needs. Paul knew he who did not spare his own son, will, but gave him up for us all, will not, how will he not also along with him freely give us everything, all that we need. He brings everything that we need to help us. So the story of Lazarus tells us something about the heart of Jesus. The story of Lazarus also tells us something about the power of Jesus. I mean, just do a quick review of some of the miracles of Jesus. Catch a glimpse of the power of Jesus. He controls the forces of nature. And so storms obey his word. He can walk across water. He can turn water into wine. Food multiplies when he speaks. He controls disease and infirmity. The lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see, the sick are healed. He has power over Satan's forces. Demons flee from him. Not even Satan can 
tempt him. Satan has no power to tempt Jesus. But of all those miracles, of all the glimpses of his power, all of them pale in comparison to this miracle. Pale in comparison to what he did as he stood outside the tomb of Lazarus in Bethany and called Lazarus forth alive. Paul declared our Savior, Christ Jesus, has destroyed death and has brought to life light and immorality through the immortality through the gospel. He's brought immortality to light. When Jesus spoke the name of Lazarus, even death became powerless before him. This miracle was the final straw for those who opposed Jesus. They knew they had to do something about Jesus. They were afraid because of this miracle that everyone would flow to Jesus, that everyone would begin to follow Jesus. And if everyone followed Jesus, then the Roman government would certainly have to come and do something to put an end to this one who was causing multitudes to follow him. And so some of the witnesses of this miracle, the raising of Lazarus, went back into the city of Jerusalem and they reported to the, those who were the leaders of the Jews what Jesus had done. And the leaders of the Jews gathered to talk about what they had to do. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And Caiaphas, who was the high priest, had an idea. You know nothing at all, he said. You do not realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. And so it was decided, Jesus must die. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. It was this miracle, the raising of Lazarus, this victory over death, that was the final blow, the greatest expression of the power of Jesus, was the final nail that caused the leaders of the Jews to plot his death, sealed his fate. The story of Lazarus tells us something about the heart of Jesus. The story of Lazarus tells us something about the power of Jesus. But perhaps most of all, the story of Lazarus tells us something about death. Because of what Jesus did in Bethany and elsewhere, death doesn't have the force that it once did. Death's power has been broken. Death has always been man's greatest fear. But in Christ, the grave has been overcome. Its power has been interrupted. Its silence has been broken. Shakespeare was wrong when he called death the undiscovered country from which no traveler has returned because there is a traveler who did return from this undiscovered country. Lazarus did, and so did Jesus. Grasp the meaning of these words of Jesus. I am the living one, he said. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. He traveled to death and back to show that he has power over death, that its grip on our lives has been broken. Death's sting has been removed. Death may harass us, but it cannot hurt us. There does remain this sting of death on a human level. Jesus understood the weeping of Mary and Martha. He, he stood with them at the tomb and he wept with them. He demonstrated his love. He demonstrated the wound that death brings. When someone that we love dies, it is a genuine hurt. It's a wound that requires healing. But it's not a wound that lasts forever. The psalmist knew weeping may remain for the night but rejoicing comes in the morning. I know that death tears at our hearts. It tears at our lives. When someone that we love dies, it, there is a deep and painful agony, but we cling to the promise of Jesus that it will not always be so, that joy comes in the morning. Death's terror has been unmasked. 
death has this mask of finality, this mask of gloom, and that mask has been torn away. In Jesus, we see that far from being the door to extinction, to nothingness, to eternal separation, that death instead is a gate that opens upon eternal joy, that opens upon eternal life, that opens upon eternal fulfillment, that opens upon eternal fellowship with God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer referred to death as the last station on the journey to freedom. And that's what we're moving toward. And in order to get to freedom, real freedom, we have to pass through that final station that is death. There's something beyond death. Jesus declared it and Jesus proved it when he spoke Lazarus' name Lazarus was still there. He was somewhere beyond death from where Jesus called him back. Death has been defeated. Oh, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, oh, death is your victory? Where, oh, death is your sting? For the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As truly as Jesus emptied the grave of Lazarus, as he stood outside that grave in the city of Bethany, outside of Jerusalem, so too there will come a day when Jesus will speak the word and every grave will be opened. And all who are dead will walk out alive again. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. In Christ, death can be viewed differently than it is by the world. In Christ, death is precious. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. In Christ, Death is characterized as a trip on angels' wings. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels came and carried him to Abraham's side. In Christ, death is a trip to paradise. Jesus turned to the thief who was hanging beside of him, and he said to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. In Christ, death is moving into the Father's house to the place that has been prepared for us. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you, Jesus said. In Christ, death is a longed-for departure. Paul told the Philippians, for I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. As Paul approached his own death, he told Timothy, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure, moving on to another place. In Christ, death is to be home with the Lord. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body to be at home with the Lord. In Christ, death is gain. Better by far than life. For to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. In Christ, death is a blessing and a rest from our labors. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, for they will rest from their labor. The good that they did follows after them. There's a story of a missionary who'd gone to Korea to preach. He preached for a number of years there in Korea, and then while he was still a young man, the missionary lost his wife to one of the diseases that was common in Korea at that time. Her last words to him, she sat by her deathbed and tears streamed down his cheek. She said, do not grieve for me, dear, for you shall get me back. A few more years passed. And again, the missionary was sitting beside a deathbed. This time, it was his little boy who was dying. And he heard him say these words again. Don't cry, Daddy. For Mommy says, you shall get us back. There were a couple of Korean women who were there helping 
and the one was weeping softly. The other woman said to the one who was weeping, why are you crying? And she said, I'm crying for this poor father. And the first one advised, don't weep for these Christians, for they have a way of getting their dead back. Weep for yourself, for you've lost a son and have no way to get him back. When Jesus stood in front of Lazarus' tomb, he showed us something about his heart. He shows us that he loves us. He shows us that he's our friend. He shows us that he'll come and he'll help in our times of need. He shows us something about his power that nothing, not even our greatest enemy, can thwart his ability to help that even death obeys his voice. And he shows us something about death, that in Christ, death's power is no more. The Bible teaches that we are made of the dust of the ground, and to the dust we will one day return. But we are more than dust, much more than dust. When God took man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living being. And so our bodies are only temporary dwelling places for the real us, our restless spirits. Death is the most solemn crisis of the soul. It's the entrance into judgment. It is the step into eternity. If in this life only we have hope, then death is a terrible tragedy. It is unrelieved pessimism. It is the dark night of the soul Somebody ought to do something about death. And somebody has. In Christ is our hope. Death has already lost its power. It's become instead the threshold to life itself. Death means to be present with the Lord, and it means a reunion with those in Christ who have gone before us. Because of Jesus, we can look at death differently, knowing that it's not merely the end. It's uh, the real beginning. As James Stewart said, let us live as people who are prepared to die and let us die as people who are prepared to live. Julian of Norwich was a Christian writer back in the 1300s and 1400s. Her most famous writing is just a short phrase that she wrote that she said, God himself spoke to her. She said, in the context of death, all shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And so we cling to that. Though we grieve with gut-wrenching agony when someone that we love dies, we cling to the promise of Jesus all will be well. All will be well. All manner of things will be well. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the victory over death that is ours in Jesus Christ. And though we still grieve with gut-wrenching agony when someone that we love dies, we grieve not as those without hope. We cling to the hope that death's power has been broken, that beyond death is real life. It is well. It is well. Amen. Let's stand and sing that beautiful song, It Is Well With Our Souls, as we declare the truth that though we grieve at death, we grieve as those with hope there's life beyond the grave.